Welcome to Chapter 24's lecture on catalysis. I'm so proud of all you guys for making it through this far in the semester. This topic, honestly, is one that we could probably spend an entire semester just talking about uh, alone. Unfortunately, our schedule and class objective constraints only enable me to address this topic lightly. So sit back and enjoy. You may not know this, but the word catalysis derives from two English words. The word cat, meaning feline, and the word lice, meaning little bugs that crawl in your hair. So catalysis really is the art of studying cats that get lice. Okay, that isn't really true, but I thought it was a hilarious joke. <laughs> I hope you did as well. After studying this chapter, you need only to be able to do the following. Explain using energy diagrams how catalysts work, what they do. <clears throat> Teach your peers about anchomeric assistance. Appreciate how catalysis works in biological systems. I'll also teach you about the following enzymes from section 9. Carboxypeptidase A, which I've for some reason spelled wrong on this slide, chymotrypsin, and aldolase, and we will skip sections 2 through 6. Jokes aside, catalysis is extremely important. A catalyst is something that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed or changed by the reaction. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a typical energy diagram for a chemical reaction. Our reactants have the stability or energy level shown here. And our products, the stability or energy level shown down here. So in this particular reaction, you can see that the reactant, or sorry, the products are more stable than the reactant. The activation energy for this reaction is called delta G double dagger. Or better said, the activation energy for this chemical reaction when no catalyst is used is indicated by this hill up here. So once again, in order for the reactants to get uh, through this reaction to be converted into products, they have to proceed, proceed through some pathway that requires this amount of energy uh, put into it up, up here. Does that make sense? This probably is something that shouldn't be too new, as you've been taught it back in Gen Chem. So here's the deal. All a catalyst really does is provide an alternative mechanism or route by which the reaction can proceed that happens to have a lower activation energy. That's it. So once again, we can see the uncatalyzed reaction here has to proceed through a transition state that is pretty high in energy. But if we throw a catalyst into the system, all the catalyst does is provide an alternative mechanism or pathway, which may have multiple transition states, but all of these transition states and intermediates are ones that are much lower in energy than that of the uncatalyzed pathway. So really, all a catalyst does, once again, is just provides an alternate pathway or mechanism to go from the starting material reactants into the products that happens to be lower energy. Now, there are a few nuances about catalysis that I require you to know. First, a catalyst does not change the energy levels of the reactants or the products. I'll say that again. A catalyst does not change the energy levels of the reactants or the products. It just provides an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy between the two. That's it. Second, a catalyst does not change the amounts of reactants or products that exist in an equilibrium reaction. It just helps the reaction to reach equilibrium more quickly. My whole reason for harping on this so excessively stems from personal experience. You see, back in 2004, just before I received my bachelor's degree in chemistry from Utah State University, we were given an American Chemical Society, or 
ACS standardized exam. One of the multiple choice questions on that exam said something like this. It said, a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction by, and then it gave us these four options. Option A, increasing the stability of the product. Option B, increasing the stability of the reactant. Option C, providing a pathway with a higher activation energy. D, providing a pathway with a lower activation energy. Or E, none of the above. Now, which one of these uh, options is a correct answer? Well, of course, the answer is D. Options A and B are absolutely ridiculous. And I want to explain to you why. Once again, the stabilities or energy levels of reactants and products are an immutable, unchangeable fact, like the law of gravity or the law of the universe that says that whichever line I enter at a grocery store will automatically be the slowest one. A catalyst does not and cannot change the energy levels of the reactants or products. All it does is provide an alternate pathway between the two that has a lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed chemical reaction. That's why answer D is correct. The odd thing about this particular question is that one of the professors that I had had as an undergraduate once told us about this question specifically. He said that he had seen on previous ACS exams numerous times this question being featured. And that oddly enough, many of their graduating seniors in previous years got this question wrong. Now I happened to remember that professor's warning about this specific question when I took my ACS exam, which was a requirement for graduation. And that's why I got this question right. Now, as I've stated, Catalysis provides an alternate pathway between reactants and products that has a lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed pathway. So the question is, how do catalysts actually do that? Well, there are lots of ways, which include sometimes catalysts work by increasing the reactivity of a nucleophile. Sometimes they increase the reactivity of an electrophile. Sometimes they convert something into a better leaving group. And sometimes they stabilize a transition state to make it easier to reach that. In other words, they take a normally high energy transition state and bring it down into a situation where it's at a lower energy level because it's been more stabilized. There are probably other ways in which catalysts work as well. The sad reality is that, as much as I wish I could, I don't have time to show you excessive examples of each of these different modes of catalysis. This makes me particularly sad because my PhD work was actually done developing new asymmetric or chiral catalysts. So I have fond feelings for this subject. <coughs> this reminds me of a story which, like most of my stories, has absolutely nothing to do with the topic at hand. I just feel like telling it because the last few lecture videos that I've given you have been somewhat light in the story department, and I just feel like I owe it to you. During my last two years as an undergraduate at Utah State University, I worked hard. I mean, I worked my butt off. <laughs> as some of you have probably heard me say this before, I never slept more than four hours a night for the last two years of my undergraduate career. I took full class loads between 13 and 16 credits every semester. I also worked a full-time job at night. I know that many of you guys can relate to that. When I got home each night, I stayed up studying until about midnight. I then woke up the following morning at 3 to 4 a.m. and started my new day. I really only rested on Sundays. Now, one of the undesired side effects of the stressful work regimen was the fact that every time I had an upcoming exam, I would always break out. And what I mean by this is I would always get a single, solitary, humongous zit, like the size of a silver dollar on my face. One zit for each exam. After the exam was over, my zit would gradually heal and go away. And then I would replace it the next week with a new zit induced by my next exam. Now, during the fall of 2003, I took a first, my first semester of general biochemistry. My professor, who was absolutely stellar, held a review session prior to one of the exams for which I had cultivated one of my largest zits ever. I came to that review session, held in a large classroom that was filled to capacity with students, and I listened intently to my instructor's review. At some moment during that session, I raised my hand to ask the instructor a question. He turned to me, listened to my question, 
and before beginning his answer, he looked at my face and said with a slightly alarmed tone, Mike, what is that thing on your face? Now, I admit this is a situation that could have embarrassed some people, but I was completely unfazed. I really don't embarrass easily, or almost ever, frankly. So I looked calmly back at my professor, and I responded, It's a zit. Thanks for pointing it out. He then went on to answer my question. Now I get to introduce you to a new topic. I want you to check out these two reactions. In reaction one, we have uh, chlorocyclohexane, that's treated with ethanol mixed in water and you end up getting two products. Now you can see looking at this reaction that this is a very straightforward substitution reaction in which the chlorine has been substituted with a hydroxy group originated from water and in the same mixture we also have substituted the chlorine uh, to a certain amount with this ethoxy group originating from the ethanol in solution. Now I want you to compare once again this reaction, reaction one, with reaction two. Reaction two looks very, very similar. Exact same reaction conditions. The only difference is the presence of this group. See this SC6H5 group? That group is called a thiophenyl group. So I'll be referring to it by the name thiophenyl uh, from now on. Now, you'll look at these two reactions. They look virtually identical except for the presence of this thiophenyl group in reaction two. But believe it or not, reaction two proceeds 70,000 times faster than reaction one. However, it only proceeds faster than reaction one if the thiophenyl group and the chlorine are trans to each other. If they're cis to each other, then reaction two, oddly enough, actually proceeds more slowly than reaction one. So what in the heck is going on? I mean, obviously the thiophenyl group here is doing something, because that's the only difference between these two reactions. But what is the thiophenyl group doing? Here's what. When it's trans to the chlorine, the thiophenyl group assists the reaction by taking the electrons on the chlorine and thrusting them down into this carbon to kick off the chloride leaving group it generates this positively charged sulfonium intermediate. The water or ethanol, whichever nucleophile happens to come in, then comes in here. The electrons go back into that sulfur to neutralize the charge, giving me this intermediate, which then gets deprotonated to give me the final product. Now, because the sulfur group in this reaction ends up unchanged in the final product, so once again, you look at the final product, this thiophenyl group looks exactly the same as it did in the starting material. Technically, this thiophenyl group is acting as an intramolecular catalyst. It increases the speed of the reaction and remains unchanged in the overall reaction, so it is acting as a catalyst. Now, this type of intramolecular catalysis is called anchimeric assistance. So why does the phenyl group or the thiophenyl group have to be trans to the chlorine for this to work? Well, as you can imagine, if this thiophenyl group were cis to the chlorine, then it would not be able to do the backside attack necessary to kick off the chloride. If it's cis to the chlorine, then what ends up occurring is the thiophenyl group just acts as a steric hindrance that inhibits the nucleophile, be it water or ethanol, from being able to come in and displace the chlorine. So that's really what's happening here, ancomeric assistance. Examples of ancomeric assistance abound. Here's another really cool one. When we run this reaction, which is a hydrolysis of this ester, it proceeds forward with a certain reaction rate that we'll arbitrarily assign one. I'm not really sure how long this reaction takes to go, but we're just going to give it an arbitrary number of one. By comparison, this reaction, reaction two, proceeds 150 times faster than reaction one. The only difference, once again, between reaction one and reaction two is the presence of this carboxylate group here. That's it. This carboxylate group is ortho. This reaction runs 150 times faster. Why? Well, to answer that question, we have to first look at the mechanism of the uncatalyzed reaction. So here's that mechanism. 
I have my starting material. Water comes in. Lone pairs on the oxygen go into the carbonyl carbon. Electrons go up. Gives me this tetrahedral intermediate. Electrons go down and displace this phenoxy group. The phenoxy group then deprotonates the positively charged oxygen uh, species to give me the final product, phenol and acetic acid. So this is the overall reaction mechanism. Now here is the mechanism of the catalyzed reaction. As you can see, the carboxylate group right here deprotonates the incoming water molecule to make it more reactive. So what's actually occurring here is the carboxylate is tearing off a proton from the water. So this isn't a neutral oxygen going on here. This is an O minus hydroxide going into the carbonyl carbon. Electrons go up, gives me this tetrahedral intermediate. Once again, you can compare this to that on the previous slide. There's no positive charge on this oxygen, so this is a much lower energy transition state. Electrons then go down, kick off my leaving group to give me the final product. So once again, I hope you guys can see here this carboxylate assisting this hydroxide group to be a little bit more active of a nucleophile. Much like the thiophenyl group in our previous example, the carboxylate is an intramolecular catalyst. Bottom line, enchimeric assistance. So do you think you have this down? Let's see. By looking at an actual example. In the following reaction, the two chlorines are replaced by hydroxyl groups in a net double substitution reaction to give us this product. But wait, what is the mechanism? I want you to propose one. And here's my hint. The rate is much, much slower if this nitrogen atom right here is replaced with a CH. Hence, the nitrogen must be participating in the mechanism in some way so as to speed up the reaction. So what do you guys think is going on? Well, I can at least subtly suggest to you that it might have something to do with enchimeric assistance. I'll let you figure it out. But if you want, you can ask me during class. This, I think, feels like a good place for us to stop. It's been fun. It really has. So until next time, I bid you all a very fond age to the Izzo.